My name's Krish Majumdar. I'm the chairman of BAFTA's television committee. On behalf of the Board of Trustees, welcome to this special BAFTA tribute for this morning. Um, <laughs> every year, BAFTA uh, gives um, a couple of special awards and hosts a tribute evening like this, and it's to demonstrate the excellence uh, of a program or team of their contribution to television. And this year, the television committee and the board decided to honor and shine a spotlight on this morning, which is turning its, its, its 30th anniversary, I think this week coming up. So 30 years on British television, and it's been uh, an innovator uh, and is a remarkable program, which you'll see. So the form of tonight, um, we've got the brilliant Alan Carr um, hosting a special Q&A with Richard and Judy and Holly and Phil. And actually, by the fact that I didn't say their full names, it shows, um, you know, there's Bono, Cher, Madonna, <laughs> Holly, Phil, um, Richard and Judy. Um, and I think that is part of the kind of genius of this morning, is that it feels that you're you know, you're with them, they are in your living room. And it's not just the brilliant presenters. Um, what BAFTA is rewarding the excellence of is a huge production team, a huge machine that goes into making um, so many hours of brilliant live television. Um, so we really hope you have a, a fantastic evening. I just want to say a few thank yous that, um, to some people who've made it happen. Um, We'd really like to thank our host, Alan Carr, speakers Judy Finnegan, Richard Maidley, Holly Willoughby, Philip Schofield, and all this morning, um, the This Morning team, and our colleagues at ITV who've made this event possible. And special thanks to our sponsors and partners, Audi. Um, and also, we're filming this event for BAFTA Guru, which is our kind of website, which is a treasure trove for content uh, that we film uh, here, uh, and this is part of the Learning and New Talent program we do at BAFTA. BAFTA is a charity, and we do events like this throughout the year, over 250 events. So if you don't know that side of BAFTA's work, please go on the BAFTA website, BAFTA.org uh, and BAFTA Guru, um, and hopefully you'll be inspired by the content. And some of this content is going to be on this morning, tomorrow morning. Uh, so we're really excited by that. So I'd like to welcome our BAFTA-winning host, presenter, Alan Carr. Oh, thanks. Oh, can you hear me? Yeah. What an honour to be asked to help celebrate this special BAFTA tribute to honour 30 years of this morning. Woo! Woo! We have exclusive clips from the ITV documentary this morning, 30 Unforgettable Years, that airs tomorrow evening just for you, okay? Yes, this morning has been going for 30 years, and year in, year out, it still delivers. A massive disappointment to Bradley Walsh and the chase at the NTAs. <laughs> this morning's like David Beckham's hair. It just seems to defy the years and goes from strength to strength. <laughs> but I love this morning. For me, it's the heart and soul of ITV's weekday morning schedule, like a slightly spicy, nutritious filling in a Jeremy Kyle loose women sandwich. <laughs> Later, as a student hearing the This Morning theme tune downstairs was like an alarm clock telling me it was time to get up and head for the sofa. <laughs> In the same way, the theme tune to the early evening news was my alarm to get up from the sofa and head to the pub. <laughs> I know, news, boring. It was This Morning that also gave me my first very first TV break back in 2006, I got asked to do a live broadcast from the Trafford Centre for Richard and Judy, my first ever TV appearance. Oh my God, can you believe that? <laughs> yeah, I know. So in many ways, I like to think it's a double celebration tonight and BAFTA are also honouring my 12 years service to TV as well. Thank you, BAFTA. 
Anyway, enough from me. Let's have a quick reminder of why, after 30 years, this morning is so special to everyone and so deserving of this BAFTA Special Award. Let's take a look back oh, at us. Good morning. 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 I must say, I'm in the mood for it. Better crack on, then. You are crazy. <laughs> Let's be having you! Next! You okay to continue now? Please continue. My name is Richard Maidley, and this is my wife, Edie Hello. <laughs> oh, ho, morning. It's live, possums, so anything could happen. <laughs> oh, I have just peed on the floor. What, Denise does? She rings me up. She says, I've got this problem letter. It's maybe a 30-year-old bed letter or something. <laughs> and we have a damn good laugh about it. <laughs> Round applause for the streaker, ladies and gentlemen. Can I have a taste of this? Oh. Mm. 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 Oh. 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 Russian roulette. Please spin the Russian. Yes, yes. Oh. Is it? In Italian, it's all about Dunky Dunky. I'm not a big fan of Dunky Dunky. Are you not? So you don't mind dunking a bit of beef, do you? It's <laughs> 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 got a mouthful of beef. <laughs> not again. You don't know what you're talking about, Phil. No way, not again. While the cat's away, the mice will play. Got an idea? No! <coughs> You're only supposed to blow the bloody doors off! It's Viagra Day. Sausage in the hole sounds fantastic. <laughs> hey, listen, family show. You all right then? Hey! You are affecting my end as well. <laughs> I don't know what to do. Dog's <laughs> lipstick. You know when they get fruity dogs, you can't tell <laughs> this. Pardon? <laughs> The British Heart Foundation, I've got a video, it's called Sex After Heart Disease, and through... Oh, God, this is... Oh, my God! Oh, 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 oh. I've been practising with this. Dog's lipstick, Eamon. You know when they get the lipsticks out, Eamon? Dog's lipsticks. I'll tell you later. <laughs> <laughs> Complete and utter madness, and we wouldn't want it any other way. OK, let's meet four national treasures who have helped make this morning a national institution. Please welcome Richard Maidley, Judy Finnegan, Philip Scoven and Holly Willoughby! <laughs> and I, Eamon! Over there. Amen, amen, over there. <laughs> I love. Mwah, mwah. Hello, 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 love, you're all right. Yeah. Are you sitting there? Like, you know, you're lovely. <laughs> I know. Where do you want us, here? Yeah, I think. Hello, <laughs> Amen, what's going on? <laughs> Eamon, why was you late? Oh, uh, I'm going to go oh. for dinner, actually. <laughs> yeah, 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 please. Thank you. Still. A spill, please. Thank yeah. you. Oh. Right. Sorry. <laughs> How are you doing? All right? We're all yeah, right, good. You? Now, Judy, no flash in your bra. This is BAFTA, not the <laughs> end of the age. I had to put that out there. I had to stop that. Right, OK. <laughs> Phil and Holly, mm. yeah. you're no strangers to winning awards, but a BAFTA special award. Come on. Yeah. This must... We've must never be been in this building before. No, you're first time. You're no. joking. Never no, been no, in no, no. Okay. Never been allowed in. <laughs> <laughs> not after tonight, yeah. <laughs> no, we're, we're all actually barred, aren't we? Yeah, we are. We're all barred, we're barred yeah. Right. yeah. One of the most impressive things is the BAFTA sausage. Oh. Um, I have, we have no sausage. idea how good the sausage no, is. No, the man in the lips said, oh, you tried my sausage. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> no, don't twist it. No, he did. <laughs> and it, it's, it's special, isn't it? We've all been on it. Yeah. <laughs> 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 but no, it is 
it's a real honour. It is yeah. a real honour. Yeah. First, you know, not many shows get to, to 30 years in the first place. So it's well, this very, is the, very special. This is the big one. Um, yeah. It's the one that we haven't had. It's the one that we uh, will treasure the, the most. It's lovely. It's lovely. I mean, the NTAs are fantastic when it's audience voted. Yeah. That's fabulous. But when, uh, when, you, when there's a prestigious organisation like BAFTA, when they... Well, you said to me earlier on, it's it's now, you know, you get you get people who've been sniffy in the past. It's mm. like 30 years who are now saying, yeah, all right, actually, it's, it's really well, good. Well, it's interesting. We're looking at the, uh, the, the broadsheets on Saturday and Sunday, and they've been mentioning this, and they've been mentioning the docker, which goes out tomorrow. Mm. And for the first time in three decades, there's been a kind of a consensus, kind of say, oh, all right, it's okay. <laughs> it's all right. Yes, yeah. it's daytime, but actually... Yeah, it's actually quite a good show. Well, you get people all the time who you can get on a train, and someone will say, "I, um, oh, you're, you're television." Uh, yes, yes. So, you, is it daytime? You do? Uh, yes, yes. I don't watch. I don't watch daytime. I never, never see day, daytime at all. You had someone on the other day. In the <laughs> Bloody well yes, do. Yes, so true. Uh, plus Why do you think it has stood the test of time? I think because it belongs to the audience. Um, and because it knows what it is. And I think those are the two key components. Um, when we began it um, on October the 3rd, 1988, God. <laughs> um, it's funny, we were talking to Chris Tarrant actually about Millionaire uh, a couple, two or three years ago over lunch, and Chris said that of all the shows that he'd done, and, and all the shows we'd done, could we think of one that we knew was gonna fly? And, and what we agreed was that actually in broadcasting, for all of us, whether we're producers or presenters, the gut lies to you. So when you think it's going to be a hit, this new series, it usually bursts into flames at the end of the runway. And when you think it's probably not going to work, it takes off and soars. But Chris felt when he was about to do the first recording of Millionaire, who wants to be a millionaire, he suddenly got an overwhelming sense that it was going to be huge. And he'd never had that kind of certainty before. And we felt in the week, the week running up to transmission, we'd done the tech runs, which had gone badly wrong. Uh, we'd done the press and all the rest of it. I remember we looked at each other about four days before transmission and said, this is going to work, isn't it? We didn't we, do press. That was the really interesting thing about local, this morning. Yes, it yes, just yes. kind of crept on. There was absolutely no publicity at all. It's true. And nobody seemed remotely interested in it. Um, even, I have to say, um, Pache, anyone here who may have been around at the time, people at Granada said, oh, it'll be off the air by Christmas. This is October. I read yeah. that, yeah. You re yeah. <clears throat> Definitely they did. So there was very little faith in it, but we had it as soon as we went on air because we knew, we could sense that there was a kind of, there was a contact with the audience. It's partly because of the phone-ins, which were, yeah. you know, mm. tremendous um, involvement with the viewers. We just felt that it was kind of normal, fairly ordinary, completely different from any other programme on TV. Yeah. Uh, there'd been nothing like it on British TV. There had been an American TV. Um, and it felt special, didn't it? And you know, when you're, you know if, if you cook, you know, you know when you're, you're preparing something new and then it's kind of ready and you taste it and it's either not right or it's exactly what you were hoping for. Yeah. And that's how we all felt as that first week unfolded. And <laughs> Diane Nelms will be coming on later, who was our launch editor and who we'd worked with before. And she was a journalist like us too. Um, she felt it too. And I remember, I think we got a million viewers on, on the first show, mm. and it went to two million by the Friday. Wow. And the proof of the pudding was kind of in the eating there. And that we was purely it. word We watched mouth. it because, because you're saying that, you know, we launched it sort of a soft launch and Granada not that really that bothered. Yeah. We, we were doing Saturday morning tele at Television Centre, which is we bizarrely where, we, where I am now. <coughs> and we all stopped um, uh, to, to watch in the office, 12th floor of the East Tower, which they just pulled down. And, um, and, and said, right, okay, let's have a look and see what they're doing. And so we, we sat down and, you know, sort of gave it 20 minutes or so and said, actually, this is really good. And what I thought at the time was this is, this is like the kids' stuff that we're mm. doing in the mornings, but for adults. Yeah. You know, this is free form, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. And you mentioned the cooking. I mean, I, I, I have to say that there can't be, and if you say no, I don't believe you, that you haven't quietly cooked at home and you've put all your little bits and pieces out, and then you've just done a little bit of a, you know, thing. Alison you've done Hammond. Alison Hammond has. <laughs> Alison you've Hammond, done... <laughs> She definitely deserves a big round of applause all to herself. We've all quietly we cooked have. quietly in our own kitchen. Definitely. So I'm just going to add a little bit of this, so I'm just going to add a little bit of that. <laughs> and uh, the co-creator, David Liverman, mm. he wanted someone famous but he saw you two doing a local telethon. Is the that telethon. right? We did the tele... 
Do you remember, I don't know if, how many of you remember, but Jerry Lewis did all those telethons in America raising money for charity, and they decided, ITV decided to do it over here. And um, Michael Aspel hosted the, the, the and network, was, the and national it was 23 thing. hours, continuous broadcasting. Nobody could leave the studio for 23 hours. You're, you're on your feet for a day. And we did the, and we we did did the, Granada, the Granada end. Granada end, yeah. yeah. Um, and yeah, they were all sitting upstairs, apparently. The bosses, they were all sitting upstairs putting together this new program, this, well, a proposal for a new program, because there were about five different television stations bidding for it. Um, and uh, they were sort of wondering about who to present it. And they were just looked over, and we'd been <laughs> dead on our bloody feet, to be honest. I'd been up there, I was putting hairspray under my arms and <laughs> deodorant on my head. And I was I just... drinking very heavily. <laughs> <laughs> But it kind of worked. We got on, and we did. We 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 did it okay. And they but, thought, but, oh, well, maybe those people can do it. They'd got the format of the show. They'd all come in on the bank holiday. Yeah. It was a bank holiday show, the Monday, because the, the treatment had to be in on Tuesday to ITV. Um, and they got the format together. Right, that's it. That's what the show's going to be. It'll come from the Albert Dock and Liverpool. Now, who can we put down to present it? Hmm. And they went through various names. No, no. And then somebody pointed at us, like reeling in the corner, on, 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 and they said, "Judy with her arms up in the air." Judy with her arms up in the air. Judy with my hands stuck to her head. Um, and they said, and somebody said, because we'd done regional television together on Granada Reports for years together, and we were doing this together, and, they, and we were married by then with kids. And somebody said, "What about Richard and Judy?" And I think it was David said, "No, no, they're just not well known enough." And Steve Morrison, who may be here tonight, said, "Yeah, but they'll be really cheap." <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Steve. And oh. <laughs> Shall we have a little look at the show's first ever promo? Oh, oh. oh I remember that. Yeah, let's have a look. I remember that. Let's have a look at this. <laughs> Hello, I'm Richard Maidley, and this is my wife, Judy Finnegan. Hello. And this is Liverpool's Albert Dock. And starting on Monday, October the 3rd, we'll be going live from here every weekday morning with a brand new programme. It's called This Morning, and in it we'll be looking at the choices and decisions that we all make about our lives and our homes. We'll be looking at food and drink and shopping and family matters of all kinds. We've got four children of our own, so we do know a bit about that. And, of course, there'll be lots of familiar faces dropping in for a coffee and a chat. So, give yourself a break and join us for This Morning on Monday, October the 3rd, 10.40, ITV. So posh. So posh. It's yeah. extraordinary about Where's your Manchester accent, girl? Well, I don't know. We were in Liverpool. Maybe I was trying to disguise it. <laughs> <laughs> now, can you remember what was in the first show? Hmm. I, don't, I think you've got us there, actually. I can't. Can you? I can't. I've no. took we can. Black. Can you? And you, you did something about bras, I think. Oh, yeah, knickers. Fashion knickers. Fashion knickers. Knickers, we really? Yeah, you yeah, did. Good friend, just good friends, just good friends, Paul Nicholas. Oh, I remember him. Oh, yeah, 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 Paul. Yeah. It's yeah, actually not that different, because when we looked at the rundown of the very first show, it's actually not that different yeah. to the same framework of our show yes. now. Yeah. And mm -hmm. I think that's why, it, you know, it's got that <laughs> same <laughs> feeling and yes. thing that it's always had, yes. really. Yes. Yeah. It stays the same. Yeah, I was just saying, you, you had Just Good Friends, Paul Nicholas, MMR vaccine, fashion knickers, oh, and a working mum phone-in. Right. I mean, it's just that crazy now, though, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I watched yeah. it the other day, there was a woman with a, was it a can of beans being pulled up by a vagina? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Don't, don't you do. Shocked. You're serious. Strongest, you be strongest vagina in the world. It oh, was really God strong, sake. yes. <laughs> Yeah, oh. I mean, it was impressive. <laughs> it was, it was. You didn't show that, did you? Yeah. Yes! Did you? How? And, you oh, didn't oh, see a nunny. No, you saw oh. the beans. <laughs> All you, all you saw, all you saw was this blonde head, and I thought it was Ruth. I'm not being funny. <laughs> <laughs> and I was... Um, and did she actually, did she actually open the can this for the was, giant? This was a no, really did. Uh, it's not you always Scott go Alan. one step too far, don't you? It's always <laughs> one step <laughs> too far. Yes. Though she could lift stuff up. Amazing. Did you should watch it. Open... It's a good show. Yeah. <laughs> did she open the tin? I mean, I, it's been a long time since I've been near a vagina. Even I never opened that. So <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> No, never mind. No. No, never mind. No, thank you. It's no, not Thailand's got yeah. talent. Thank okay. you. Um, <laughs> like you said, it was an instant hit. It doubled its ratings by Friday. Let's see what made your show a must-see for the viewing public. Hmm. One more time. I love Rich and Judith. I love everything about you. Leave my wife alone, sir. <laughs> 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 Actually, a choice of yours. At least if you spill food on it, no one can tell. You know what's going on? 
Please tell us. I have no idea. You have got to give. I think that Stella is really nice. It's all Excuse right for you. You look something. terrific, Judy. I look like something out of the Rocky Horror Show. Dude, you look really lovely. Honestly, <laughs> you look really lovely. Oh, ho. morning, morning, morning. Yes. I think there's only one word for a man like that. It's very peculiar. What does it take to murder someone you love? I'm glad you've brought test test <laughs> testicle. I can't even say. I'm so embarrassed. Into the kind of arena of uh, chat. We had to go there. Yeah, um, and and we people have... used to say, you know, Richard and Judy, what a load. And, and yeah. now, <laughs> and now, and now, <laughs> my name is Michael Kane. <laughs> <laughs>
actually informed her sensitivity so that when she wasn't just some sort of agony aunt, sort of giving soppy kind of, oh, there, there kind of noises, she gave proper advice and she was really, really comforting in, in a very strong way. And she'd stay on after the show. You talk about the, mm. the girls and most of the girls in the back room. I can still see. Uh, Denise's piece would finish at about maybe half past 11. We'd come off air at about 10 past 12. And we'd go down the corridor and there was a phone in the room. We'd always stick our heads in and say thanks. And on Denise's day, she was always in there yeah. with headphones on, on the phone, talking. And we'd have our meeting, have our conference and have a bit of lunch. And by now it's two o'clock. You know, any other agony art would have got the train home by then. We'd come, she'd still be in there, talking and talking and talking. She was absolutely remarkable. Yeah, she absolutely. Really we, and we all miss her. Well, yeah, so, we yeah, we miss her horribly. Yeah. And, uh, and, and Denise and, of course, Dr. Chris, who's, who, who's with us now, you know, the, those, those original experts. Is Chris here? Part, yeah, yeah. Yes, Chris is here. Chris Wright. There he is. Chris, have you got any value? Oh, yeah. 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 Is Chris your actual? It was yes. your actual doctor. He was, yeah, he was? in Manchester. Yeah. They were How did you have a patient's feel about it? <laughs> <laughs> Basically, what, once we once we'd won the once Granada had won the contract, they started. They, they, we had like two months to get the show together and to appoint people and cooks and yeah. gardeners and all the rest of it. And the last person to be appointed was the GP. And we had a meeting about it. And someone said, "Well, we just don't know." And we said, "Well, Chris Steele, he's our GP in Didsbury in Manchester. He's brilliant. And you've been on Granada reports a few times, haven't you, Chris? You've come on and done some." You've done a few though. You've done some regional appearances, and he was a natural, a natural. We said, "Our doc," and, he, and he's our doctor, so we've we've got a relationship with him. It's real. And the, and, and the thing is, he was always, still is, very very warm, and I knew that would come over really really well on yeah. television. You need a doctor who is warm, not slick. You need someone warm. who's warm yeah. and who can reassure you. You are slick though. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Hello, you're on Strictly. I've not met you. Hello. <laughs> and we're going to Dr. Rand's Dr. Rand. Yay. I, thought, I, I thought the joke about the miniature umbrella on Saturday was hilarious. <laughs> oh, I, I thought that was so... Did you mind it? It was brilliant. It was so funny. <laughs> Tess was in bits, weren't she? I've never seen it. She's always so professional like that. <laughs> Let's go. Let's go round with couples. What do you? Why do you love working? What do you love working uh, with Holly? Why do you well, love working with Holly? And Holly? It's. Uh, I mean, it's. It's easy. I mean, I, I. There's never been. I hate getting up in the morning. I can't bear getting up in the mornings. I'm a. I'm a late night person. But. Um, but the, what, what's fantastic is that I know when I, when I wake up, get in the car, and I'm on my way to see my best friend. Um, and we, uh, if this is, I never, uh, <laughs> I never, I, I, I haven't got a sister. Uh, I've got a brother who I love dearly, but, but Holly's like my younger sister. And I love the fact that we have the same sense of humor. I love the fact that it works at the same speed. I love the fact that we, we laugh at the same things. And there are times when you just look and the, all you have to do is look. Mm. We've noticed. <laughs> <laughs> we've never, ever had a crossword. Which is mad, the amount of times we've spent with each other. Yeah. And like, even when we're not working, you know, we have that lovely time off in the summer, and we're very lucky, and we thank you guys for that, actually. You put that <laughs> God, away. your holidays. Yeah, yeah. you did. Um, we then we, we see each other when we're away, and I think that, you know, you couldn't, you couldn't do that many hours of TV together with all the different subjects you have without there being some sort of relationship that's yeah. utterly real. You know, with Eamon and Ruth, you know, you married and you put the marriage We've in. We've never had a crossword. No. <laughs> 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 um, but the other, the other brilliant thing that, that Phil, you know, besides the friendship, is that he, he very much believed in me, I think, from day one. Because I think when, when I got the job in the first place, that was very much down to Phil, you know, putting me forward and saying that he wanted to do yeah. the show with me. And I know for a fact there's no way that I'd be sitting here now if he hadn't championed me in the first place. And, you know, he's always the first person that helps me. You know, I hadn't been in this. I'd come straight from kids. You know, I'd done a bit of dancing on ice. But really, this was my first big footstep into grown-up telly. You know, I could do live. I've yeah. done that in kids. But it's a completely different thing. Um, you know, you, you just, you know, you're a journalist. That's what you did. I definitely wasn't that. So I've had to really learn... Um, and he's taught me that, and he's never got bored of, you know, taking me through bits while I'm going, right, just explain this to me again, right, well, what, what, that? And he's been really good with that, because most people were busy enough on that job as it is without having to kind of daily go through it. And oh, I hate it, drives someone. me mad. <laughs> 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 so I'm very, I'm very lucky in that way. I've learned, I've learned an awful lot from, from the best, that's Aww. for sure. Aww. Aww. 
Well, you've got a great chemistry. Let's see it in action. Oh, God. <laughs> oh, please do me. I know we haven't got time to do it now, but can you just stay and do me? <laughs> that sounds uh, like an offer I'm going to get again, so uh, absolutely. It says, uh, hold it six inches away from your face at all times to avoid injury. Oh, OK, that's about six inches. Mm. <laughs> OK. <laughs> I'm sorry, but someone's being very rude. <laughs> Still to come. To, uh, to come. <laughs> You're just such a stutter. I, do, I know it's a really mad thing to say, but I don't think I realise that turkeys had testicles. Seriously, uh, since thing. you've been up the flap, or whatever it's called, <laughs> it's been... Or uh... <laughs> well, how do you say again? <laughs> we had this conversation this morning. You've been a nightmare to cook with. <laughs> <laughs> I think, is what okay. you're... Well, you know what I meant. <laughs> does it spray all around your... No, no, not the, the stick then, your... don't I? No, but the stick, but the mere... Liquidizer stick. does. Sorry. Right. Yeah. But no, I've never whizzed it over the kitchen. No. <laughs> should have not. <laughs> Hang on, lads. Got an idea. No! <laughs> We're on the telly. I know. Oh, what are they going to say <laughs> now? What, 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 what? Oh, yeah. We've run out of fuel! Hey, <laughs> <laughs> All right, then, let's move on. OK, so, obviously, you might have noticed we're still wearing the same clothes. <laughs> um, I haven't been home yet. <laughs> Thank you so much for making this happen. It really does mean the absolute world. As and we celebrated tell. on behalf of each and every one of you. <laughs> 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 it just makes you smile, doesn't it? Yeah. Well, as, as well as the very best presenters, this morning always delivers incredible, incredible guests from proper royalty to Hollywood royalty like Will Smith, Helen Mirren, Samuel L. Jackson and Prime Ministers, Theresa May, David Cameron and Gordon Brown. Richard, why do they choose to speak to this morning and not say, off the top of my head, chatty man? <laughs> 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 Well, why? why? Probably, why? they probably know that you terminate them. Oh, you? Yes. Um, I don't know. I, I think, again, it comes back to connectivity. And I think we probably had more no's from big politicians over the distance than we had yeses, yes. because they knew that um, it wasn't going to be a formatted, and it's the same today with these guys, it wasn't going to be a format interview, the kind of thing you might get on Newsnight or uh, the Andrew Marr show, great as they are. This was different, this is real. And there'll probably be a phone-in invol uh, element involved as well. Uh, so it was risky. It was, it was risky, but if they got it right, and, uh, and if they were direct and open and honest, they would connect. They'd connect with the viewers, because the viewers were there to be connected with. So I think they, could, they saw the programme as an, an opportunity like no other. Yeah. Um, you do get these momentary insights behind the theatre, behind the stage, into what might be the reality of what's Well, we've always on. said what we, the, 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 what we love is that, uh, and we have, we have such a hot team that, uh, that, that, that book our guests and are constantly on it. And, uh, and we're often asked, you know, can you have, you know, you obviously have your free ideas, have your free ideas. Yeah, yeah, you can have as many ideas as you like, but invariably say, oh, my God, we should have, yeah, booked them. Oh, where did you see we've got a booked them? Um, and the, the, they, are, they are always there. And so you watch something maybe over the weekend or something developing and thinking, God, this is a hell of a story. And the next morning, then you're meeting them on the yeah. sofa. And what I love about the show is that, and I do think this sets us head and shoulders above so many other shows, certainly any other show of our genre, is the mm -hmm. fact that you have time with yes. us. Yeah. And we, we can sit down and we can allow a little bit more room. We had, um, we had the, the couple on this morning who tragically lost their daughter when she <laughs> bought the prep baguette and had the oh, dreadful... Parents, yeah. Yeah. parents came on this morning. Oh, you. You know, and so, and we, but we had enough time to think, you know, they were pouring their hearts out, to say, right, OK, well, let's dump that, let's dump that, let's yeah. dump that, let's let them talk. Um, and, uh, and that's the beauty, I think, of this morning. Yes. You get people who come on, and we love this, when mm. you get people who come on who sit down and almost conspiratorially will sit opposite you and say, I came on here because I trust you. Um, and they'll tell, they'll tell the worst possible thing that could yeah. ever happen yeah. to someone, but they trusted us but that's with their what story. It is. The thing is, this morning is like their friend. You know, you're in their room for two hours every day, and I think that trust does build up. Yes. And it's I think so important. And what you say about the flexibility, because it's live and it's two hours. I mean, the week, I think we're coming onto this later, so I won't say too much here, but the week that Diana died, I remember we, we were in bed on a Sunday morning and my son came in and said, Diana's dead. 
He said, what? Put the telly on, and there it was. And that week, we thought that for maybe for the first two days, we would do nothing but the Diana story, because it was huge. Mm. We did nothing but Diana, Monday to Friday. We just kept throwing, throwing away videos, cancelling interviews, and just focusing on this constantly changing story. Because like by the Wednesday, it was all about where are the royals? Why are they still up in Barrymore? Why haven't they come down here? Do you and there think was a whip of revolution in the end. Do you think that was the first, because just remembering that time and what was said about the show at that time, mm -hmm. was that even the sniffiest were saying, this is a show that absolutely has its finger on the, on the pulse of the nation. Yes, I, I think everybody right. was saying at that time, yes. what you're doing is how everybody feels. Yeah. Yes. yes, I think I, I, I agree with you. I, I do think that's when we sort of turned a corner. Mm. And not that it matters what the critics say. Who cares? You, do make, you don't make the show for them, as I kept saying. You make it for the viewers. But yes, definitely the week that Diana died and the way that this morning responded and the team responded and made all the bookings that you would have expected, just as you said, we'd come in and it was all there and it was fresh and it was of the day. You know? And it was our first week on air after the summer break. It, yes, that's true. And yeah. Nick Bullen, who I know is here somewhere, our it was his first week his first term as editor, and we had to throw everything out. And it was, uh, it was pretty hairy, I can tell you, but it, it mm. felt really exciting. I mean, that sounds awful. It was a terrible, terrible, terrible tragedy. But in terms of broadcasting, it was, um, it, felt, it felt really true. Yeah. It felt yeah. that we were yeah. doing the true thing, you know. Mm. Even your phone-ins are star-studded. I remember one of my favorite moments of this morning is watching it and then George Michael himself <laughs> Rings you up. Yes. Tell us, please, how did that happen? Did you know him? And how well, no, we only really re <coughs> finding out how actually generous and what an amazing man he was, aren't we? Yeah, he was incredible. Well, I, I actually, you know, it's funny. I don't think it's dementia yet, but the fog of time does tend to obscure things. And I do remember being told a minute before we put him on air that it was George Michael. And we said, what, the George Michael? Yes, <laughs> George Michael. And I can't quite remember what it was he'd called in about. But that was our first contact with him. And then about, so that was in the summer. And then the really big thing that happened was, it was, uh, it was you still run the Christmas Appeal, don't you? You have a Christmas Appeal? Um, in various, yeah, in various okay. forms. Yeah. Well, our Christmas Appeal that Christmas was to fly uh, deprived children to Lapland to meet Santa Claus uh, and their parents. So we had the plane books and we had the hotels books and it was a real treat for deprived children. We're gonna fly about 300 of them out uh, to Lapland. So we launched the appeal on around about December the 1st to, uh, you know, with VT and all the rest of it. And then we asked people to phone in with, onto the donations line and start giving the money. We came off air. And our editor, Karen Smith, at the time, was waiting for us just outside the studio, like jumping up and down. He said, how's, how, how's the money coming? And she said, we've got over 100,000 pounds. We said, what, on day one? She said, yep. And she said, but half of that's from one person. We said, what, 50 grand? She said, we've had 50,000 pound donation, but I can't tell you who donated it. We said, who's donated the 50,000 pounds? <laughs> and she said, it's George Michael, it's George Michael. I said, well, get his number and we'll, we'll call him up to thank him. So we went home and I called George that evening and he lived in Highgate and we live in Hampstead. I called him up, never, never spoke to him other than the phone in before. I said, hi, George. She said, hi, hi. And she's standing behind me. Oh, my God, he's talking to George Michael. He's talking to George Michael. <laughs> and um, because, you know, you can be blasé about some name, but yeah. George Michael and his, in his pomp, you know. Uh, so I, I did the two or three minutes and I thanked them all the rest of it. And I said, you live, you're only about a mile away, aren't you? He said, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm home from a, a couple of weeks and I'm going on tour. And I said, um, well, do you want to come around for Sunday lunch this Sunday? And Judith... <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I said, I'll, I'll cook, you know, um, come on. He said, can I bring Kenny? That was his boyfriend, his partner. And I said, sure, yeah, that's fine. Uh, I said, okay, so one, yeah, one o'clock, yep. see, see you Sunday. Put the phone down, turn around. And she, for the first and last time in our marriage, was doing a handstand. <laughs> <laughs> Actually doing a handstand. <laughs> Which I'm sure we'd love to see again. <laughs> <laughs> but, no chance. But, but just to say about not being blasé, so flash, and I, then I, of course I immediately regretted it, what have I done? Anyway, flash forward to Sunday, five to one, the doorbell goes, go to the door and there's George fucking Michael. <laughs> you know, on, looking amazing and in his, with his shades and slim and gorgeous and with Kenny, his gorgeous American partner, and in they came and I retreated back into the kitchen and after about five minutes George came in, leaving you guys talking, and uh, he said, just want to say no carbs. Now, we all know what that means now, but I'd never heard that expression back then. This was about 20 years ago. I said, no, what? He said, no carbs. I said, George, I'm sorry, you're talking a language I don't speak. I said, well, what are you saying? He said, no carbohydrates. I'm going on tour next week and I can't eat any carbs. I said, oh, I see, so what, no roasters? Could be having roast duck. He said, no roasters, no roast parsley. No, no, none of that. I said, okay. So I served him a, a sort of a limited portion and we all went into the dining room. And within two minutes, he was nicking roasters off everybody's <laughs> plate and stuffing them. But, uh, but again, you, you cut... That's this morning for you. Yeah. Um, and, th uh, and those are the kind of, 
if you like, presenter privileges, mm. if you like, the little spin-offs that occasionally come along, uh, which you never take for granted, and just are to do with the programme and nothing to do with you. They're to mm. do with the programme, and it's like a little, like a little bonus that but you everyone get. everyone watches it. Like you said, the people are asking, but everyone watches it. I don't know anyone who doesn't watch mm. it, who just mm. watches it. Mm. Well, if you, add, if you add the figures up, and it's, a, it's an interesting mix because it's how many individual people watch that show over the space of a week. So you can look at any one time and it's you know, sort of 1.5, 1.7, whatever, whatever you happen to be getting at that time. Um, and, uh, and it's really, you know, now it's highly competitive. Um, we're running, you know, we fight the BBC constantly. We do very, very well against them. Um, but if you, uh, if you take those figures, and because people will dip in, they'll dip out, they watch a little bit, they do their ironing, turn it off, watch a bit they like, mm. what, turn it off a bit they don't like. Um, but add them up, and it's massive. Yes. It is millions upon millions mm. of people who will dip in and dip out, who catch a little bit of it. I think that's what the advertisers love as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, we're going to go to uh, another VT in a minute, but before, because we're running out of time, but I've just got to talk about, you know, you do push boundaries, uh, even if some of those boundaries I feel you don't really need to push. <laughs> um, this morning, likes to do taboo. I mean, some of your lesser-known guests you've had on the sofa are the woman who gave up men to have sex with ghosts, <laughs> the man with 200 love dolls, the woman who can orgasm for 18 hours just by hugging, a woman who can't stop eating her armchair. <laughs> I mean, when I went on there, there was a woman who could uh, tell your future by reading asparagus. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I was on with Justin Lee Collins. He went, you can't do that. See, she tells us we're going to die. I'm like, it's asparagus. <laughs> <laughs> How can she say that? Weirdly, weirdly, that, that list, I'm afraid, I've got to say, I think they're all I ours. know. I think they're all <laughs> yeah. We did have Viagra, though. Yeah, we yes, yeah, you did. did. Viagra that was a big one. Because you, you gave the man Viagra, didn't you? Then we you had to go and see if it worked. We had three, three we had, couples. No, we had three couples. Uh, and all of, the, all of the guys had problems. To be, it's a grown-up audience here, and there are no TV cameras getting it up. They couldn't get it up. Uh, and they came in very bravely <laughs> to talk about their own... All right, then, their erectile dysfunction. Oh, don't be dirty. And, and they <laughs> And, they were, and it was very this morning. And we took it, obviously, very seriously. And, you know, they talked about what it, what it had done to their marriage and what it was like. And we said, well, OK. But this was the week that Viagra went on prescription. And we said, OK, well, we've, as you know, we've got each of you 100 milligrams of Viagra, and you're going to take them live on camera. This was just after we've gone on air. Supplied by years. Dr Chris. Supplied I by Dr Chris. From his own personal supply. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, he, and unfortunately, he'd stand up and take it out well. if he could. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, so the, so the three guys simultaneously glass of water, take the Viagra, and we say, OK, and now off you go to a hotel around the corner with your, your wives and uh, come back at the end of the show and tell us how it went. So off they disappeared. Now, Viagra takes about an hour to work, I'm told. Um, <laughs> and, um, and we had a researcher's training and we, and down and, the corridor. And researchers took them to a hotel just around the, uh, the corridor, and we had a live link to a researcher with a camera in the corridor. No. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. And every now and again, we go to the researcher and say, how's it going? She said, well, I don't know. I mean, you know, the doors are like, I can't hear anything, and all this nonsense. Um, and then after just nearly two hours, they all came back. And you could tell immediately that for one couple, <laughs> it had worked. They were just <laughs> breathed in smiles, yeah. Uh, the other one, it had half worked, and, and one hadn't worked at all. Anyway, oh. it, was, it was a classic this morning. <laughs> <laughs> I can give you their number if you like, Holly. Um, <laughs> anyway, it, was, it was a quintessential this morning item, and, and quintessentially the criticism in the papers the next day. The Daily it. Mail. Mm. Well, it was the man and others, and it was sort of, um, was this the tackiest, tawdriest two hours in British television Is history? This the no, it show? bloody wasn't. It was real. Everybody was talking about Viagra. Everybody wanted to know if it worked and how it mm. worked and, and, and how quickly it worked. And we had three real couples who did it and they were very brave to do it and came on and spoke very openly about it. And that is the kind of thing that this morning does mm. to this day. Yeah. And that it stops doing that is the day it stops doing this morning. Mm. Mm. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. So what is keep it up. Yeah. <laughs> oh. <laughs> You're on fire. <laughs> uh, tomorrow night, uh, I think it's about 7.30, there's a 90-minute documentary, and it's, and it's, the, it's this morning through the 30 years. And there is some stuff on there which I've never seen before, mm. voiced by Joanna Lumley. I mean, what a coup that was. But there is one of my favourite bits I think I've ever seen. Uh, do you remember the Chippendales? 
Oh, oh yes. God, yeah. Oh my dear. Oh my God. So the Chippendales, bearing in mind that when this morning was on with you guys, yeah. kids telly followed it. I mean, there was no loose women, and we didn't sort of set the tone of, of, uh, of the, the way we do now with daytime telly. Um, and uh, and the Chippendales were on. And they went for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they did. But like big time. <laughs> so much so that for the documentary, the lawyers said there was stuff that had to come out of the documentary <laughs> no, no. that had been transmitted at 10.40 in the morning. <laughs> but what no. you have, True. which is just the best, I know. Is, the, is the director, they've, they've got a recording of the director in the in gallery, the gallery yes who's saying, oh, God, cut wide, cut wide, cut wide. And at one point, you hear him say, I'm never going to work again. <laughs> <laughs> and, me, and, and meanwhile, poor Diane, Diane Nelms, was Our actually editor. having a nervous breakdown. Because what, what had happened was the Chippendales, who knew this was their... They knew it was live, so they knew it couldn't be cut. Uh, so they went for it, and they'd been told and told and told, and they'd signed all the forms and the release forms not to show their willies. That was just <laughs> not... Did they show willies? I don't remember. Did they show their willies? I believe they did. did they show they... Or was that that, part, was that, that might have been a bit that was cut out. She knows. <laughs> <laughs> Alison but knows. they did much more than they were supposed to do, put it that way. Well, yeah. they got, they got these, all these women. We did it, because we were doing it for the Liverpool Albert Dock, which was a great set, really, because it was just not one location. It was kind of... Uh, it was one of the reasons why we got the franchise, I think, because the Albert Dock was such a fantastic set. Uh, we were all round the place in cafes and on the walkways and everything. And we did it in a pub, didn't we? We got a load of women to watch, and that's, I know, that's it, because they were grinding up against the women, weren't they? They, they got them up. They were what doing, I, they were what doing I sandwiches. Do, sandwiches. They were doing sandwiches. Bearing yeah. in mind where, <laughs> thankfully, where we are now in our relationship with one another, and we are considerably more hopefully understanding yeah. than we were then, things that might have been seemed appropriate at that point are now deeply inappropriate yeah, now yeah, yeah, yeah. what i think the uh, what i think the the team had a problem with <laughs> was uh, was that it, it, the chippendales were full on with with one woman and then took another one from behind that's right, that's right yeah. and it was the fact that the one that was right. front on was okay because she was facing them but the one <laughs> they took from behind quite obviously had not given her approval <laughs> It was so funny. I don't think so funny. This was the point about the audience. The audience kind of a, were hugely entertained by that show, and I don't think we got any complaints. Like similarly, um, around that time, and this is the late nineties, we interviewed Anna Chancellor, who famously played Duckface and Four Weddings and a Oh, oh yeah. Yes. Is that oh, right. is that in the docker? No. Oh, I wish it I was. It, yeah. It's yeah. so yeah, funny. Basically, it, live interview about eleven o'clock. Came out of the news at eleven, and uh, Anna Chancellor's here. She's in a play. Da, 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 da. We'll talk about the play in a minute. But of course, we best know her for this. And I think Four Weddings had come out about five years earlier. So we showed the clip where Anna Chancellor's up at the altar with. Hugh Grant, towards the end of the film, about to marry him, and then Hugh's deaf brother signs and says, no, but he loves somebody else. And the vicar says, do you, Charles? Do you love another? He says, yes. And she knocked him out. So we showed that clip, and we came out, and it was me going into the interview, and, and like you, we didn't script our interviews, we just did them al fresco. Uh, and I said, um, we'll talk about the play and stuff in a minute. A great film, that, Anna. We've seen it millions of times, but your character, Duckface, uh, I must have seen that film 10, 12 times. And there's never any reference in the dialogue anywhere as to why she's called Duckface. And obviously you're beautiful and you're beautiful in the film, so that <coughs> nothing to do with the way you look. Do you know why? And she said, and she's so innocent, Anna Chancellor, she said, oh, well, I suppose probably, you know, it's in her backstory somewhere, it would have been in the notes, that at uni or something, they would have called her Fuckface. <laughs> <laughs> and as, as we all know, there's, <clears throat> there's a protocol when somebody does that on, on daytime television, and Judy picks it up immediately, turns the camera, and this is to get Ofcom off your backs. Hello, Ofcom, if you're in the room. Um, <clears throat> and Judy said to camera, obviously, Anna didn't mean for that, for that to come out that way, and if you were at home were watching and were offended by that, then obviously we, we apologise. And have, she leaned across and grabbed Judy's wrist and she said, no, but it's true, Judy, she would have been called Fuckface. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's brilliant. And I, and I said, and Judy's like, well, and I said, Anna, you've got to stop saying that word. <laughs> <laughs> it's 11 o'clock in the morning. And then suddenly the penny dropped, and she fell into your arms, didn't she, in tears? She just collapsed on oh, me. Oh, it's so a little But you know, not, <laughs> not one viewer Not objected. one complaint. Not we just got viewer. two calls, and people saying that was hilarious. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, you've got a grown-up audience, haven't yeah. you? Yeah. It's a grown-up audience. Yeah. 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 Um, we can talk about George Michael and all the madness and everything, but one thing, uh, one time I think, um, the time I think this morning comes into its own is when it campaigns <laughs> and puts a lot of social issues forward for mm -hmm. discussion and everything. I'm going to talk to you two about that uh, a bit later, but 
You were the first, you had on this morning, it was the first demonstration of how a man should examine himself for testicular mm. cancer. That was Chris that again. Was Chris. <laughs> yeah. 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 Now, that's, that's <coughs> amazing, isn't it? And who what thought that through and who came up with that idea? Because God, probably, so Chris. Thinking. probably Chris. Probably Chris. I think it would have been Chris, yeah. He would have, you, you would have, go on, Chris. It was you, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He, would have, he would have militated for it. He would have started to have vague memories of him sitting in meetings and saying, you've got to do this. This is a major killer of men. And, this, and we can't do it at one stage removed. We've got to show how you examine. I and mean, that means getting a male model in, and we've got to see his testicles. And in fact, we agreed that he'd mask his penis, didn't we? His, he, he, the penis was masked by the hand. Ask Alison testicles... she seems to know a lot about cocks. <laughs> <laughs> was the penis covered? <laughs> yeah, yes, Professor of cocks, Alison Hammond. <laughs> <laughs> It was definitely covered, but, thank but, you. But they sh but, but, and like Chris, a dirty and, question time. And Chris, and Chris, showed, Chris showed how a man with his, with his two middle fingers yeah. should, should feel his testicles to feel for a lump. Yeah. And we have people discovering that they had cancer. Yeah. Yeah, we had men uh, within the weeks to follow saying, But I wasn't yes. allowed to watch. Why? You were behind a screen, Because I was you? a woman. I wasn't until I had to sit behind a screen. So they could watch it at home on telly. Telly. But she couldn't see it in the flesh. And, and Richard and Chris could be involved in what was going on. Right, I yeah. just had to sit there going... <laughs> 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 but how does that even come into the dialogue of doing it for the show? I mean, who do well, they would that probably have, OK, the show is so news-driven, there probably would have been, I would imagine, at that time, some big report saying that testicular cancer was, a, was a, becoming a major problem and that men didn't know how to self-examine. Chris would have picked up on that and would have come in at the weekly meetings and would have said, we need to do this on the show and this is how we need to do it. And we would have gone to the lawyers and we would have gone to the, to, to the exec producers and people like Diane Nelms and there would have been a general agreement that there'd be no point in doing it if we didn't do it properly. So if you want to show a man how, a man how to examine himself, yeah. then show it. You know? And it's not sexual, uh, it's just a part of the body yeah. and it's a part of the body that could kill you. Um, mm. So it, it was a no-brainer. Mm. Um, and we did it and I don't think we got any negative press for it. But so before it's time though, because you, you had the first gay wedding and yeah, yes, we did. 13 years before it was legal. Yes, yeah, we did. Yeah. How did you get around that? We just did it. <laughs> <laughs> we, we just did it. I think the thing is, when we were in Liverpool, this sounds strange, but we felt very cut off from Granada headquarters, which was in Manchester. <coughs> and because we got this strange setup on the Albert Dock, it wasn't even a proper studio, it was a converted car showroom. Um, <laughs> and it, honestly, really, and we felt like we were pioneering, didn't we? We felt like mavericks, didn't we? Yeah, we yeah. felt we were kind yeah. of out there. And there was a, a joyous, wonderful feeling that we could do anything we liked. And also, as Julie says, we were in Liverpool and we were surrounded. We used to come out of the show and we had to walk down the colonnades to get to the office. And there'd always be a crowd of, 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 of scousers there to, you know, to, to talk to us and what they want. No selfies in those days, it was autographs, you know. Um, and give us feedback and all the rest of it. Um, and sometimes it was negative, uh, but it kept you real. And I remember on a Thursday once, we closed the show by saying, now tomorrow on the show, take that. <laughs> Now, we didn't say live, because they were coming in that afternoon to do a pre-record. So we just said, and on tomorrow's show, the new one from Take That, here in the studio. And we went. Next morning, we come in, and there's about a 1,000 Liverpool oh, schoolgirls, wow. because they'd thought that they were coming in live. And oh. to be fair, we'd been a bit vague about it, so we'd, we'd made a mistake. Anyway, we kind of fight our way through. We do the show. We show the video. The girls are furious that Take That aren't there. And we left the studio to be confronted by this mob of, 15, of furious 15-year-olds. And we deserved it, you know. And um, we were trying to explain and apologise. And I've never forgotten this kind of shop steward of a schoolgirl came up and stuck her finger right against my nose like that. And she said, you lied. I said, well, we didn't actually... Look, OK, fair. We didn't actually... She said, no, you lied. You said take that would be live. And they were, I said, no, we didn't say that. But I agree, we should, we should have been clearer. She said, we know our rights. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and that was the point that she lost me. And I said, what rights? What, what, what rights? She said, we know our rights. I said, but you don't have any... Well, never mind. Um, but, but, but that kept you real, you know? Yeah. I mean, they would tell you when, when you... And we had screwed up there. It, it was a mistake. And, um, and they, weren't, they weren't shy of telling us. <laughs> and, Harley and Phil, you've been campaigning for hashtag Be Kind and Project yeah. 84, about male suicide and bullying. Yeah. Um, yeah, tell us about that, how, how to get involved in that. Mm -hmm. and well, I think Phil mentioned this in the phone-in to begin with that we discussed earlier, and that's what that was born out of. And lots of these ideas happen in that way, a bit like what you were saying there. You know, it's not just a group of people sitting there with its producers or whatever with an agenda. You know, sometimes it works like that. But most of the time, it's much more organic. And, and that was listening to what was being said. You know, that started off as a phone-in and grew into something that I know myself and Phil and everybody that works on the show are really proud of. And we have our Be Kind pack, which is online. And teachers, parents, kids can download that. It's a way of starting a conversation about bullying in, in your home if you want to teach your kids about bullying. 
if you think your child is being bullied, if you think your child might be a bully, um, if you go to a school and you keep saying, because that was the thing, our advice was, you know, speak to the school, keep going back to the school. And what we were hearing back so much was actually, there's no policy really on bullying. You say the school has their own policy, mm. but actually it's not a national thing that seems to be rolled out. And lots of these schools just didn't know how to address it or didn't know how to make a difference. So this pack was put together and it was everything in one place. It was an assembly that you could do with the whole school. It was a way of bringing up the conversation. Yeah. We had our Be Kind wristbands, which had been sold, uh, which had been given away. Media, social which you media, which didn't have. It's yeah. Yeah. so important yeah. now, isn't it? Social mm. media. Absolutely. Well, it's made a big difference. And, yeah. uh, and I've got to say you know, that, that we talked to, you know, about Dr. Chris and, uh, and Denise as well. And our doctors that we, we have, Ranji's here, and so we've got the, the, the team of doctors that work with Chris now. It is extraordinary how many people say, if it hadn't been for this morning, I would have died. Mm -hmm. They sit and watch it, whether it's a testicular examination, whether it's a breast examination, whether you're talking about you know, moles or whatever it is that we happen to yeah. do, you'll have, you'll have you know, tens of people who will sit there and go, the hell is that then? Maybe he's, I'm going to have that looked at. Yeah. And then the next day, so I've been to the doctor and thank God I was watching your show. And it happens over and over and over and over again. And through television, I mean, all doctors obviously save lives. But Dr. Chris and, and, the, and the rest of our team over the years have saved literally thousands yeah. upon thousands of lives by talking about things, being honest about things. And also in those early days, pioneering those examinations, which yeah. now we do. And, the, you know, there, there are still people who go, I can't, I can't believe you're doing that, but less and less and less yeah. and less yeah. now. And because, because now it's not unusual. It's not unusual to talk about. Mm. I mean, this is just is some of the numbers for this morning. 2.1 million followers on Facebook, wow. 2 million followers on Twitter, 1 million followers on Instagram, and 1 million followers on YouTube. That's right. you. And you're always on social media. Mm. People call you Phil I Am, don't they? <laughs> <laughs> Can I just say that tomorrow is a big day for us, assuming that tomorrow is actually going to, uh, it's, it's the day that we have, and I think we're the first one certainly of, of, of our um, television group, uh, we've got our own app coming out tomorrow, mm -hmm. so we're, we're launching yeah. an app. Ooh, yeah, so, yeah. Yeah. Now, to all, of course, over the years you've been the faces of this morning, along with Eamon and Ruth, but there's always been a massive team of experts and contributors to help you, hasn't there? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And do you know what I love at the NTAs is when you bring everyone up and you realise how much of a family it Quite is. Quite frankly. Um, Richard, the experts cover everything from cookery to fashion, money to health. Just how important is the sense of team on this morning? Crucial. Um, it felt like a family from, from day one, actually. Um, and we all knew each other, actually, mostly. I mean, obviously, we knew Chris really well. Um, Susan Brooks, who was the first kind of regular chef cook on the program. Garlic ice cream. Garlic yeah. ice cream, mm. which tasted awful. That's in the, um, <laughs> that's in the documentary. We have to pretend. Is that in the docker? Yeah, yeah. Right. Um, but we'd known Susan for years. She'd been at Granada. She'd been a researcher. And then she'd, she'd done a bit of presenting. But we'd known her for, for many, many years. Um, and quite a few of the experts were already insiders, as it were. So we all trusted each other. And most of them got it. They got what the show was trying to do. And there hadn't been a show like it before. There hadn't been a show which had all that lifestyle in it, as well as the journalism blended in. Um, so no, they were absolutely crucial. And we did a lot of auditions to find the right people. But increasingly, yeah. we found there were people that we actually knew. Um, and I, so it had, it had a family feel from, from the off. There's a, um, there's a thing, I think, when you, when you start on this morning, that um, because we see that it's Denise and Chris, really, 100%, that when you, when you get in there, you almost seek their approval. You're mm -hmm. desperate. You want to make sure that the, you know, Denise and Chris like you. Yep. Um, and you had that, didn't you? I really did. did. Yeah. Oh, my yeah. gosh, yeah. I mean, are you, you started this morning, so you don't want to know what it's like to come into that show I as a imagine. newbie. Yeah. It's utterly terrifying. <laughs> I mean, it really is. Because also, I've, I'd watched it as a viewer. I'd watched it as a fan for many, many, many years. Mm. Um, so you don't want to mess it up. <laughs> you know, you don't want to be the one to take it down. <laughs> it's been going for 30 years. Um, and I do remember there was, we were doing, we'd started doing our debates and I can't remember what the actual debate was about, but there was Denise and she used to fantastically sit there sort of quietly listening to the person who was sort of giving the opposite opinion to her and you'd get the Denise eye roll and you'd get this. And, and then she'd say what she had to say beautifully and brilliantly and always absolutely bang on. And I remember I backed up one of her points and she looked at me and she just went, and I thought, yes! <laughs> <laughs> I've got Denise. I was so happy. 
Well, let's take a look at some of the contributors in action. Morning. Hello. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the show. I'm Philip Schofield. And I'm Karen Keating. It's bring your husband to work day. <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> They've put us in charge. What were they thinking? And while the cat's away, the mice will play. Oh, that's that. good. That's <laughs> good. OK, time for something a little more savoury. I don't know much about cooking. For 30 years, food and drink have been a recipe for fun on the show. Just don't mention garlic ice cream, a new dish concocted by the team, but served up by the show's first cook, Susan Brooks. Oh, that's really horrible. Oh. That's when I'm a sad, lonely person. Alison. My name's Alison. Yes, no, I know, I know. There's another member of this morning's family the A-list love spending time with. Alison Hammond had been, you know, on Big Brother, and who would know that there was such a genius presenter in her? Snapped up by this morning. I'm on your new roving reporter. I'm so excited. A little, uh... uh... <laughs> <laughs> Will it warmer? You should... How many have you got? None, actually. Not in a kitchen. No, it's not when they're spitting fat. It's not overdone, <laughs> okay? Done foul. He's just like got balls of steel. I, mean, I had to fight the powers that be to get best examination, you know, onto television. We always thought we could handle it in a way that mm. didn't put people's backs up or make viewers think, oh, this is embarrassing or whatever. Make sure there are no little lumps right at the back of the breast. incredible that it's a daytime TV show that can make you do that. Those medical checks over the years, which we've continued to do, have saved countless lives. Well, following the success of the breast examination, I strongly uh, requested that we do testicular examination live on the show. Come on, Chris, we're going to go around. This, right. is, this is boys' time. <laughs> there was a little bit of, oh, my goodness, they're doing that now. I'll also admit, we thought it would cause a bit of a stir and would get us a little bit of coverage and would be quite good in the ratings. You stand in front of the mirror and you actually look at the testicles. You can see now his left one is hanging slightly lower than the right. It was fine to see the testicles that were being examined, but no other part of our model's manhood could be seen on camera. You must pull that aside because we're going to get fined if you don't. He showed his willy on this morning. If it's for science, you can. To no one's surprise, there were complaints but the item also saved lives. We got a, a very quick response. I think that's because of the shock element uh, of it. Again, that was a first on national television. I saw your programme and I had uh, testicular cancer, thanks to Chris. You have literally saved lives, because Robert wouldn't have found those lumps and it could have been inoperable. And I think we have the, uh, some of the experts and the contributors here, so just stand up and give us a wave. Go on, don't... A wave of you. Yeah. <laughs> Who's the person that comes up with those quiz questions? Like, what's your name? Well done, you've won... <laughs> A holiday to you Barbados. Don't have them. You don't have them anymore. Who? Oh. You don't. They're what, the kind the of questions you ask someone if they've had a head injury. For the, the for the competitions, we don't even have no. questions. We don't even have questions. There are anymore. no questions anymore. Is that one there? You just phone us. up. Oh, you just phone up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh. oh, okay. Oh, well. <laughs> okay. No, no, I don't. Know. Okay, Holly. How many people work to get an? Ep how many people in your team to get an episode of this morning on the telly? <laughs> Oh, God. I mean, there are loads of us. And there's different... We have sort of day teams. So you have a different team for every day, really. But, I mean, there are many wheels in motion to yeah. get that show on air. Um, so they kind of they kind of take the days to, uh, in turn, really, I mm. guess. Um, what would you say? <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to think. I mean, our day teams... How many on a day? How many, how many are team? there in the office? There's about 100. A hundred people in total. I'd yeah. say about yeah. 30 a show, wouldn't you? All in all. You get the day team and then you've got the entertainment bookers. I don't know whether there's quite 30 no, on, I was a, on, say a, on a team now. I think, I think it's sure. le it'd be less than that. But a hundred, a hundred over, a hundred overall. And that's, you know, that's the team 
that uh, that actually are in the studios uh, yeah. on a daily basis. But then you've got you know you've got our uh, competitions team. You've got mm. you know all those all those other in integral parts that are back in the office. Every time I've, I've been on, there's a real hive of activity. I, mm. I do, yeah. I'm yeah. jealous of you <laughs> doing it because there is a real buzz there. It's like being it's like being back at school. It's like yeah. having a school day. You know, you've got the fashion cupboard and you know you've got wardrobe. Yeah, it is like that. Room and, you know, you've got Fleur in the green room, and it's like it's just a nice thing. You see the same faces. All it's proper telly. Coming. It's yeah. proper yeah, it telly. Feels like you know, yeah. Bits yeah. Of it. Yeah. And and also now nice we've um, we've moved to to the to, to television centre. Yeah. Um, you know, you've got the big dock doors of uh, of the studio. So we've driven all sorts of. We've had a tank in there. We've had yeah. you know our taxis in there. Mm. We've had you know, we're, we're we're waiting for the elephant. You know, so that'll yeah. that'll be next. Yeah. And, and also, it's it's throughout television as well mm. that. People you meet in television now, years and years and years on, often started off on this morning as researchers, yeah. Yeah. Um, whatever, and they began. I mean, we tell this story now that Nigel Hall, who is now head of uh, global head of psycho productions, and Ben Frau, who is now head of Channel 5. Um, babysat our children one New Year's Eve back in Didsbury. <laughs> <laughs> All those years ago. When they were yeah, kind yeah. of researchers. And, you know, and look at them now. And it's, it's, an, it's amazing. I mean, it was a huge training ground and proving ground. Yeah. And we're, uh, it makes me feel immensely proud and immensely warm that so many people have come through and got to the very, very top and they started with us on this morning. Yeah. It really does. <laughs> What about the next 30 years, you two? I know. What would you like to achieve then? 30 well, years? Where do you see it going? What do you, what? Well, while well, I think it... No, you, you go. No, I was going to say, I mean, I really think if you look at how it's changed in the last 30 years, actually, it, at its core essence, it hasn't at all. Like, those values are still strong, um, and, it's, and then that can never change. So I think, you know, if this morning is lucky enough to be here in 30 years' time, which it absolutely should do, because... It's not afraid to change. It's not afraid to adapt. It's not afraid to listen to what you know that viewer at home wants and expects to see. I think there's no reason why why it can't be. Couldn't agree more. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Okay, we're going to ha have a few questions, but let's uh, let's just watch one quick VT. It's just a few of the many people who cut their TV teeth working behind the scenes on this morning. Let's have a look. The great thing about the show is that it's really relatable, but it's also aspirational. So that means you get stories that touch everybody, but also you have moments where you've completely inspired people or you've saved people's lives. Well, I think this morning literally ignited a revolution in daytime television. And I think it made television addressed at women respectable. We've never seen a husband and wife couple hosting a show before. Um, and Rich and Julie had this remarkable ability to talk to people at home. There was no subject with Rich and Julie that was off limits. It was everything from debt to arguments to love to marriage to divorce to testing Viagra. You name it, we did it. The studio offices were on one side of the dock near the Pump House pub and in there you had the gallery, you had um, the actual, the editor's office, the makeup, wardrobe. We used to have one computer between four of us on a day team. So if you wanted to find a contributor, you had to write them a letter with your phone number on it and ask them to call you the next day. You had to get in a car and drive all the way around to the other side of the dock where the studio was. And in the studio, you had the green room. In the winter, the wind used to blow through that place. Liverpool didn't look like Liverpool looks now. It had one hotel. And you would be going to see Shirley Bassey at this hotel, or John Gilgood, or the Prime Minister. From 7 o'clock onwards, you'd have guests arriving in the offices who <clears throat> then had to go through makeup, wardrobe, be briefed, and then bust round to the other, uh, to the green room. It was so new and so raw that we didn't have any facilities. So literally, Judy and I, in the break sometimes, would whip over to the public loos, and I'd have to say to people, do you mind if Judy jumps the queue? Because she's on television any minute now. It wasn't as if it wasn't a working dock. So there were always there was a huge car park there. I remember one time there was a circus that had pitched up, so you had all the trucks and everything blocking entrances. If you wanted a clip to set up an interview or an item, 
you used to have to call Harold in the mail room in London and ask him to physically find it and put it on the overnight van. Many, many times you'd be in the car trying to get a guest round to, um, to the studio for a promo and you were dragging them out of makeup and shoving them into cars and you'd never met them before, you'd barely spoken to them on the phone. It becomes the most important thing in your life to get them onto the studio floor. How we ever got that show on air, God only knows, but we did. I have so many early memories of this morning, but I think the starkest one is that on the launch day, the first ever programme, we decided that we would show the viewers how to iron a shirt, and it was excruciatingly bad, and we never did anything like that again. Dominic Mohan, who was the showbiz editor of The Sun at the time, had done a reader's poll um, for them to decide which look they thought Richard Maidley should adopt, and they had voted for him to become Ali G. And I remember me, Richard and Judy sitting down and writing this sketch with Judy interviewing Richard in character, and we broadcast it as a pre-titles tease. I mean, what the viewers must have thought, God only knows, because we hadn't set it up, it just appeared out of the blue. This morning is the programme that I always think made me the series producer-director that I am. I think this morning is still incredibly um, crucial to the schedule of daytime television, and I think that's because it respects its audience. It's a bit like Britain's Got Talent. It's a variety show. So one minute you're cooking, then you, next minute you're doing water births or phone-ins or fun. So it's always changing. And, and because of that, it's never, ever got stale. It's still as fresh today as it was on those first episodes when we made it. Congratulations to this morning team on receiving the BAFTA Special Award. I love watching Holly and Phil on This Morning Every Day, but I particularly enjoyed working with Richard and Judy. You taught me so much and a massive thank you to you all. Congratulations team this morning on being honoured with the BAFTA. Every single person who worked on the show over the 30 years has made it the institution and the national treasure that it is, and it's richly deserved. Congratulations this morning on your BAFTA special award. Much deserved, 30 years. Thank you so much for letting me be a small part of that. Have a wonderful night. Many, many congratulations, Philip, Holly, and all of the team at this morning and I wish you another 30 years. Right, OK, let's have some uh, questions from the audience. Hands up, please. We've got some roving mics, have we? Where's the one with the roving mics? Oh, lovely. one Hi. roving mic. Oh, two roving mics. This lovely lady here. <laughs> Can't wait. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, my hi. name's Diane. I've I'm, I'm come up from Southampton, and uh, I'd just like to thank you all for being a big part of my life for the last oh. 30 years. I contracted ME um, 27 years ago, so you're a big part of my life, and I'm actually 60 on Wednesday. Oh. Well, happy oh. birthday to you. Happy I have applied. I have applied for the present, but I haven't heard anything yet. <laughs> can I can I ask you a question? So you say that we've yes. been a part of your life. So because we've all been talking about our memories of this mm -hmm. morning and what's made it so special, why have you stuck watching it all that time? Um, because of the variety and everything, right back to the um, Liverpool Dock yeah. um, years mm -hmm. and everything. <laughs> and it's and I'm almost housebound. So. Yeah. Right. So it would have been your 30th birthday, the day that we, we launched the show? Yes, it was. Oh, wow. Yes, yes you, it was. Did you see the first show? So I'm double your, double your age. Amazing, amazing. <laughs> well, not yours, personally. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. I'm double this morning's age. <laughs> yes, but I did watch the very first one. Yeah. Amazing. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Yeah. 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 Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you for coming yeah. up. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for being a great part and a great programme. Cheers. Oh, Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Any other questions? <laughs> oh, some of that there. Oh. Look, you've had the three most faced people <laughs> in the whole audience. 
Hello. Hi. Hello, Hello love. Um, I am um, growing up with this morning. I'm in my 30s, and um, I would love to see it continue for another 30 years. Yeah. Um, what seems to be coming across from what everyone's saying tonight is that there's this like huge respect that you've got for your audience and that you listen to the demands of the audience and that's the key to its success over the last 30 years. So I'm just kind of interested really um, if you can kind of tell me what the audience is telling you at the moment, like moving forward into the future. Mm. I mean, obviously with this app, that sounds really interesting. Yeah. I'm yeah. Interesting, I'm you know, keen to hear more, but kind of like how to maintain the next generation of, of viewers really. Yeah. Like I think what probably plans you, are. Yeah, Alan touched upon it earlier on and I think that's, that's uh, social media. I mean, oh. it's the, uh, not only the benefits of, from, a, from a, a show's point of view, from a broadcaster's point of view, <laughs> having absolute instant access to the people who are watching the show, whether it's on our own uh, social media feeds, whichever one you happen to be looking at at the time, whether it's on the on the show's social media feeds, in which mm -hmm. we have iPads in front of us all the time. So you can ask for something and you can get it immediately. You can ask a question and get it immediately. But as well as all the benefits of social media, I think what is reflected now from our point of view are the, are the pitfalls of social media. And that seems to be more and more and more reflected in the phone-ins and in the mm -hmm. issues, whether or not it's, it's kids who are being bullied online or, uh, or the body image. So, um, so a, a, a big change, I would have thought, from, from your, your day would have been the, the fact that you have this fantastic tool which, you know, which provides such great wealth and content yeah. with the audience, but also has horrible teeth sometimes. But in our, in our day, the, the, the feedback was personal, you know, um, and obviously the majority of it was, was very nice, but you couldn't guarantee that. Um, we don't want to be too cosy here. I remember once I was in the, in, in the middle of our time on this morning, I was walking um, along the cliff coast path um, at our place down in Cornwall. And, um, you, as you'll agree, you get to, when you've been on television for a while, as, as you approach a stranger, you get to see an expression on their face. It shows that they, they recognize you. Sometimes it's, who do I know that person from? Or they, they recognize you. You also can tell if they like you or not. Mm. And I was walking on this, this cliff path, and this big bloke came around the corner. Beautiful day, sea to the left, cliffs to the right. It was absolutely gorgeous. And as we got closer, one, I could see that, yeah, he clocked me. And two, he loathed me. Oh, I, could, I, could, I could just tell it. I could just see it in his face. It's fine. And that's fine. That's, that's his right. You know, there are people on television I loathe. You know, it's fine. It's, it's free. So we're getting closer, and it's just the two of us. No one in sight. And we, we have to sort of stop for each other because it's a narrow path. And I said, half expecting what was coming, I said, morning. And he couldn't bring himself to speak. He just sort of gutturally went, like that, and walked on. OK, fine. So I carried on to the, to the local village, Paul Perra. got my newspaper. I go every morning, got my papers, my bread, my stuff, my milk. I'm coming back with my knapsack full. And bugger me if he's not coming back as well at the same time. <laughs> Only this time, as we got within sight of each other, yes, he recognised me. Yes, he still loathed me. But now he thought of what he wished he'd said. <laughs> <laughs> and was, and I, I could tell he was probably going to tell his wife he had said it. But now we have the chance to do it. So I'm looking, for, I'm looking forward to this. So I slow down, it's a big blow. A lot, a lot of Brummies go to Cornwall in the summer. And uh, I'm sorry if you're from Birmingham, I do a terrible Birmingham accent, but anyway, he stopped in front of me, huge bloke. And I said, we meet again, good morning. And he said, I just want you to know that everything you've ever done, everything you've ever said, everything you ever will say and do, I loathe and fucking despise. <laughs> <laughs> and I looked after him and I said, You've made my day. <laughs> and he said, well, I said, thank you for the story. And, you know, it's a true story. But so you, do you get, ever get a little bit of that? I walked... Uh, <laughs> a, bit of, a bit of hate? I walked, uh, walked past the bloke in Westfield, and as I walked past, he went, that's Richard Madeley. And I went, fuck off. <laughs> 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 well, do you know what? It's almost time for you to get your hands on your BAFTA Special oh. Award. I love this morning, and I love coming on, and I just think it's absolutely amazing. And here's to the next 30 years. Oh. Greg, do you agree? Yeah. <laughs> just in case this slips away, because this is going to end now, can we thank you for doing a fabulous job tonight? And look oh! Out. Thank you. Right, well, let's get you your BAFTA. Please, welcome to the stage. It's BAFTA Television <coughs> Chair, Krish Majunda. Thank you, Alan. What um, a really special evening. Um, for me, BAFTA is about two things. It's about excellence and inspiration. And I think we've really 
seen that this morning embodies that. And I think the, the thing that I kind of saw on stage tonight and through all the clips, um, I saw some real alchemy, and I'd say you're all alchemists. The kind of relationships that you have on screen, and it's not just you as the brilliant presenters and Ruth uh, and Eamon as well, it's the huge creative team. So this BAFTA special award, which I'm going to get here, uh, is for all of you. Um, so on behalf of the Academy, please welcome to accept this special award, Judy Finnegan, Richard Maidley, Holly Willoughby, Philip Schofield, Eamon Holmes OBE, and Ruth Langsford. thrilled to bits. We never thought we'd get one of these. I mean, we always thought BAFTA was a bit too high class for us, to be honest. <laughs> but it's lovely, lovely, even though we've been gone for so long from the programme. It is absolutely lovely to have the achievement of that show um, applauded, because Diane was absolutely right what she said. Diane Nelms was absolutely right what she said in that little clip. This morning absolutely revolutionised daytime television. Um, it's very hard work. It's tremendous fun, and we're all very, very proud of it. Thank you. I'm holding it first, look. Um, it's been so lovely sitting in the audience and watching all this, and, uh, and Eamon and I are very proud to have been a part of it. And I used to sit in the control room at West Country Television and watch Richard and Judy. I wasn't on TV then, I was a transmission assistant. And then I used to watch him on the dirty feed on the BBC. And I used to go, oh, he looks nice. And here we are. <laughs> and here we are, uh, married, working together, uh, alongside Richard and Judy, Phil and Holly. And it's always been my absolute dream to work on that show. And every day, I do. I still pinch myself and go, I'm so lucky to be here. Um, and thank you to all our fabulous team. Yeah. You know, you're all amazing. And it is all for you. We don't just do, do this on our own. So thank you. We're very, very thrilled. I just want to know what a dirty feed is. <laughs> <laughs> to download that. Um, wow. I mean, it's amazing, isn't it? I think it's to be stood up here holding a BAFTA for a show that you've been lucky enough to even be a part of is quite incredible. Um, this morning has the best team, I think, in TV and has done for 30 years. Um, Everybody who's been part of this show, it's, you know, you saw it there on all the clips, people saying it was something that shaped their career, something that will, you, it stays with you, this show. It gives you something that no other show can, I don't think, whether it be friendship or whether it be skills and telly or whether it be, you know, whatever you take with you for, for the rest of time. So I think this is very special and everybody should be very proud of themselves. There we are. Well Thank you very much. Can we say thank you, BAFTA? Yeah, thank you, BAFTA. Thank you, BAFTA. <laughs> so thank cool. you very, very much indeed. Are you gonna... Thank you. Yeah, go on. Can I, can I go my on, DNA? On. This, yeah. this is going to go to an ITV executive's cupboard okay. in about 20 minutes. So everyone get their DNA on it, so <laughs> we're part of it. OK. Um, I, I've said enough tonight, so I'll, I'll just say thank you, BAFTA, seriously. Um, we're we're all, all thrilled about this. For Judy and I tonight, we weren't, we weren't sure how we'd feel. And we're not sure how we'll feel watching the documentary tomorrow, though we've seen some excerpts and we feel a bit, bit calmer about it now, because it's such a huge part of our life, which is over. Uh, it's locked off in the past. We can't go back there except to see the clips and stuff. So emotionally, um, it's quite trying. And seeing some of the clips tonight, in particular, Denise, who's no longer with us, um, and, and others, was, uh, was surprisingly moving. Um, so we're going to probably watch the doc documentary tomorrow night like that, you know, sort of um, from behind the sofa. Um, but it's so nice of you guys to come along and be such a lovely audience and to kind of get this morning, because either you get it or you don't, and obviously you do. Thank you very much indeed. And on behalf of the production team, I'd like to um, welcome to the stage editor Martin Frizzell and co-creator Diane Nelms. Oh, gosh, that's 
that's great for me to hold it too. Well, it's just been wonderful for me to listen to all of this this evening. And uh, just as Judy said, it just brings back memories of, honestly, I think the happiest time of my life um, when we were all doing this morning together. The, the truth was, that hasn't been mentioned t tonight, was, and it was a bit of a secret, really, that I, Granada was only given three months. We were actually commissioned until Christmas, and all the other ITV companies, and there were many at the time, were very, very cross that Granada had won this commission. They felt that Granada were these sort of rather northern intellectuals who could never understand daytime or lifestyle programming. And indeed, um, I have a cutting framed in my study, which came out about a fortnight after it was announced that I was going to be the launch editor. And I was very upset at the time. And it said something on the lines of that it's a very sad day for television investigative journalism when someone of the calibre of Diane Nelms goes off to a northern city to make knitting needle television with two unknown presenters. <laughs> <laughs> the truth is that, um, as Judy and Richard and Philip and Holly have said, all of this success in television is about teamwork. Um, television isn't just made by one person. We had the most amazing team. Richard and Judy and I always had an incredible chemistry, but the programme team were wonderful, and people of Shoe Richmond and Liam Hamilton, who I think are here tonight, um, they were always coming in with great ideas, some of them very good, some of them not so good. And, of course, people like Chris Steele, who's been mentioned tonight, and dear Denise. And, Chris, I thought of you today when it's all over the news that Serena Williams is, um, has announced this great campaign to advertise breast cancer and how you can spot the symptoms of breast cancer. And I found myself shouting at the telly, I'm sorry, love, Chris Steele was there 30 years ago. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thank you, Diane. Um, hello, everybody. It's a bit like juggling several Ming vases at once looking <laughs> after this morning because you don't want to be the one who's going to drop it. Uh, and so it's, uh, as it's been said already, it's a juggernaut of a show. It's pretty much like a Hollywood movie. Actually, it's longer than a Hollywood movie to produce every single day of the week, almost 52 weeks of the year now. It is nonstop. It's an incredible responsibility, but it's such, such fun. I was just watching that um, clip of the previous this morning producers who said they had to send down to London for tapes. It's a lot faster now, an awful lot faster, almost too fast because what we haven't had time to put into the documentary, which is on ITV tomorrow night at half past seven, is the most, late, the most latest um, bizarre situation where we had a guest just, it was two weeks ago, Jack Black was on the show <laughs> and he was, you know what's coming, and he was promoting um, one of his new films, and he had a 12-year-old sitting beside him with a bow tie and little glasses and... Uh, uh, and <laughs> sweet little kid. And we got on to Jack's kind of past, and Jack um, recorded some albums with um, Dave Grohl from the Foo Fighters. Uh, and clearly, as he's saying this, our sound department, you know, sort of, God bless them, they're thinking, oh, well, Foo Fighters, we, we may have to call up some music on this. So they're looking down their lists as he's going on, and he said, yeah, I was in a band once called Warlord. All oh, right, so the sound department are doing this, and the conversation starts and carrying on with it, and we start to run a bit of Warlord. Uh, there was the title track, I Am the Warlord, you know, underneath this conversation. And we're carrying on there, and at one point, it's just about to come to the lyrics of it, and uh, we hadn't seen this, so sound are doing their best. We didn't know what the lyrics were. We just presumed it's a song. And Jack Black, God bless him, God bless him, says, oh, I'm not sure this song is for daytime television. <laughs> and so we just cut the sound straight away. And so yeah, it came off air. And so then we played the rest of the song. And six seconds later from him saying that was, I'm going to fuck your life up. <laughs> But not just in that way, like in a really nasty, I am the warlord, I'm whatever. And I could just see those Ming vases just going like that. You know, fresh down. So thank you so much, BAFTA. It's three words those of us in daytime thought we would never say, which is, thank you, BAFTA. Yeah. Thank you. And just finally, as a Manchester United supporter, I want to thank you because this is the only trophy I'm going to see this year. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you.
thank you to BAFTA and you, the audience, and obviously a massive thank you and congratulations to Richard, Judy, Phil, Holly, and all of this morning team, past and present, who have kept us so brilliantly entertained for the past 30 years. And here's to the next 30. Good night. <laughs> <laughs>